Welcome to another SME Media webinar. Our topic today is setting your cutting tools up for success. The webinar is sponsored by Arch Cutting Tools. Hello, I'm Bill Koenig. I'm a senior editor at SME Media. Today, cutting tools do more and last longer. There have been advancements in cutting tool technology, coding chemistry, and optimization in machining. Our presenter today is Bill Orris of Arch Cutting Tools. He will go through how to set up cutting tools for success. Steps include evaluating the effective use of cutting tools in your processes and taking a complete view at each step of the setup. He will also discuss understanding the speed, feed, and depth of cut. You may ask questions during the presentation. Just use the Q&A box on the side of your screen. We will collect the questions and conduct a Q&A session after the presentation. Now, here is Bill Orris of Arch Cutting Tools. Take it away, Bill. Thank you, Bill Koenig, the SME leadership team, and all of those in attendance. We really appreciate the opportunity to partner with them as SME, I'm sorry, on such an amazing platform. So let's get started. We all know that in the 21st century, there have been some very significant advancements in cutting tool manufacturing technology. Advanced coding chemistries and new optimizations in machining programming, metal removal processes to elevate the design capabilities and streamline the manufacturing process. Thus, the cutting tools in of itself can do more and last longer than ever before. I would be walking us through several critical building blocks in setting your cutting tools up for success. Starting with evaluating the effective use of cutting tools in your process, taking a more holistic view at each step of the setup and connectivity to your machines, and referencing the recommendations by manufacturers creating the most efficient tool application environment. That's the ultimate goal, right? Creating a successful environment for our cutting tools to be fully optimized. Emphasizing the cutting tools holder connectivity, and in some cases, where we are underutilizing the holder's true function to fully take advantage of optimizing its effects on the complete process capabilities. I will share with you my outlook on how to successfully review the environment that we are creating for our cutting tools to be successfully applied. Understanding that statistically, up to 70% of cutting tools are still misapplied in the field today. But with the way we access the information and resources we have today via the web and apps on our smart smartphones, this percentage is being incrementally lowered as a result of raising the level of awareness and the increase in our base knowledge of cutting tools. The critical value I want to deliver uh, today is thoroughly evaluating the entire job from machine spindle, the tool holder, to the cutting tool itself, and to component fixturing and how everything in between is working in concert directly affecting the cutting tool performance. Ultimately, helping you create cost savings opportunities and increase productivity throughput results in your company. So our topics of discussion will be the following. 21st century cutting tools. We all know there have been some very significant advancements in today's cutting tool manufacturing capabilities over the last couple of decades for sure. Tool holders, placing an emphasis on the connectivity from the cutting tool itself to the machine. You have options, understanding holder types and proper uses and knowing you have the right holder for your application. We'll talk a little bit about spindle maintenance modern maintenance and vibration monitoring technologies, more importantly, the things to consider when using this technology. Component fixturing, the effects that proper or improper fixturing have on the cutting conditions. And finally, a little bit different look into the three critical parameters of speed, feed, and depth of cut optimizations. So when we're ready to start a job, we typically open our catalogs, or launch our web browser and make our selection from a nearly endless array of cutting tool options. This stage, there are several important issues that are typically considered to arrive at a purchase and decision, such as tool material. So for, for carbide tools, the grain structure is important in this decision making process based on a particular application or material to be removed. 
we consider tool geometry. Just some of the most basic parameters include side rake angle, clearance angle, cutting edge radius, and a number of teeth and spacing or flute density, or the actual cutting tool itself, whether it's a solid substrate or an inserted tool. Tool coating type, so many coating types, application process specific macro geometries, and a number of recipes and coating layers that are available in the 21st century of cutting tools. Edge preparation, the cutting edge may be sharp, honed, or a chamfer, or many other forms of edge prep that may be added to help increase coating persistence or adhesion characteristics. We have coolant types, cutting fluid type and the application method affect the tool life. CNC part path, strategy used by the computer numerically controlled or CNC part program can affect the time to machine and the tool life. For example, conventional or climb milling, the tool path geometry such as spiral in and out, constant radial engagement, tracoidal and dynamic milling strategies, all of these need to be selected by the process planner. Tool holding, wow, this is a big one here. And this is where we're gonna spend the majority of our time helping us to better understand that you have options. How long should the tool holder be or how short? What connection type, for example, collet style or side lock is best for the task at hand? After almost 30 years in the cutting tool industry, I am well aware that sometimes we forget to even consider the tool holding and assume we already have something that will quote work, unquote. This is where I feel that we all fall short of the setup process, and in more times than we would like to admit, we are setting our cutting tools up for failure and not success. According to a recent Grandview research report just a few years ago, the CNC manufacturing market size will be worth north of $100 billion by 2025. This implies an increased demand by OEMs and other users for controlling budgets, minimizing the human workforce, and reducing rejection or scrap parts in mass production industries. This subsequently indicates an upswing in CNC applications that typically include drilling, linear plane milling, slotting, engraving, contour milling, threading, and turning are just some examples. CNC machines are used in the production of industrial components with the intention of minimum or low human intervention. CNC machines are highly productive and reduce the cost if they are used efficiently. These machines have high accuracy and flexibility in manufacturing, but are costlier than conventional machines. Precision spindle bearings and the spindle itself is at the heart of these machines. However, an astounding 26% of the downtime in the automotive industry alone is due to a varied combination of spindle and or tool failure. And other industries like aerospace and medical, for example, are experiencing very similar numbers to this in the way of downtime, unfortunately. And as we all know, this is where the connectivity between the machine and the cutting tool itself takes place, the spindle, a critical subsystem, a rotating axis with a taper at one end where the tool holder and the cutting tool of choice fits. The spindle includes a rotor shaft, bearings, and clamping system. It operates at varying operating speeds based on all kinds of materials that are cut with various types of cutting tools. So its uptime and reliability are vital. Breakdown of a spindle impacts throughput, so monitoring its health is extremely important. I would say that we've all been guilty of focusing too heavily on cycle time reduction and not the overall equipment efficiency, also known as OEE, which begs the question, how much did we actually gain by reducing a particular cycle time if our OEE was way out of spec? Always remember that the machine uptime is of greater importance than the cycle time. I often refer to this as green light machining because we all know that one supervisor or that plant manager that is looking out through the production floor seeing how many green lights are on. And it's even quite possible that person is you in that role, right? We all love to see green lights across the CNC production floor. More times than I wish to, to admit, I have been called in to look at a cutting tool failure with all of the fingers being pointed back to the cutting tool itself, only to uncover the, an inferior spindle 
or a damaged tool holder, and then sometimes the combination of those two. But for the next several minutes, I want to share in more detail how serious this connection point is to be taken and continually monitored, creating an environment for our cutting tools to be set up appropriately. So let's stay focused here uh, on the tool holder itself for a few minutes. Modern CNC machines feature high capacity tool changers that automatically swap tool holders in and out of the spindle as needed by means of a high speed swing arm or a rotary carousel. Common connection types are primarily cat V flange, HSK, CAPTO, or some other variation of connection type we all have in our facilities. Just as any other cutting tool component, tool holders should be examined periodically for wear, and if necessary, replaced to maintain optimal cutting performances. New operators should be taught how to properly evaluate tool holders so that they can recognize when tool holders need to be replaced to prevent premature cutting tool failure, scrapping a component, or even worse, expensive damage to the machine spindle. Many operators do not know why it's necessary to replace their tooling or have the experience to recognize when it is time to do so. Determining if a tool, com a tool holder's component needs to be replaced is not a difficult task, but it does require that the operator is trained properly and knows what to look for. One of the biggest indicators of a worn or failing tool holder is tool runout. This is when the cutting tool itself is not rotating as close to the center axis as it should creating a very unstable cutting condition for the tool itself. And don't forget, the longer our gauge length is or the overall tool length becomes, the more exaggerated this tool runout also becomes. Here's an example of a small diameter three fluid end mill being subject to either the wrong holder type or selection and potentially a worn or damaged holder. The end result is premature wear and added workload on one of those three flutes. In this case, example D, letter D to the far right is having to work almost twice as hard or double the actual chip load it was programmed for due to cutter runout. In this environment, even if we are able to adapt the conditions to aid the cutter runout, we are fully aware that the next flute in line, letter C, will be the second cutting edge to fail. And when it fails, the trailing flute B will follow shortly thereafter. If you have any experience being physically around this, these cutting tool conditions when they take place, then you are fully aware that the audible sounds this failure makes. As each cutting edge begins to fail and the cutting force is transferred to each of the trailing cutting edges, the sound of the cutting action begins to increase significantly. And you will more than likely experience an increase in your spindle load meter as well. If we do not address the root cause of this, we will continue to experience inadequate tool life and poor process quality throughout the production run cycle. In this four fluid end mill example, showing the measured cutting force components in the presence of actual cutter runout, it can be seen here that the actual engagement of each tooth deviate from the nominal value as cutter runout affects actual tooth cutting radius engagement. This will continue uh, or will contribute to unfavorable cutting conditions such as poor surface finish, premature tool failure, and potentially under-optimized cutting parameters, trying to accommodate both chatter and poor surface finish. What does our first instinct tell us to do when we are experiencing these type of unfavorable conditions? Slow down the speed, or slow the feed rate, and in some cases, both. In the end, we are simply trying to calm the tool down, but never really addressing the root cause of the issue, resulting in an underutilized and under-optimized cutting tool environment. Cutting tool runout is almost never a singular source. In this example of an ER collet style holder, we can clearly see the stack up of tolerances before we even introduce the cutting tool itself. You have the taper to pocket tolerance, then you add the pocket to collet variation, and then of course the collet taper to ID bore tolerance. And we haven't even mentioned the possibility of this holder being worn or damaged, or maybe showing small micro fractures in the ID taper of the holder, which will ultimately add to the overall runout of the tool. Regularly cleaning and inspecting this type of holder is critical to the performance and the life cycle of the holder. I have personally seen indentations of cutting chips 
in the ID taper wall where the holder did not get properly cleaned, shifting the collet off center, of course, and resulting in the tool showing, showing excessive runout. You have options when it comes to tool holders. And these options are critical to the process requirements. All five of these tool holders do the exact same thing. Hold the round tool in your machining setup, but have varying levels of accuracy in doing so. Starting from the left, would you consider putting a high performance end mill in a Jacobs chuck holder? Or would you consider putting a high performance micro tool in a side lock or an ER holder? Or does it make the most sense in your application to go all the way to the right and use hydraulic or shrink fit with the least amount of runout? This is where it takes a little extra intentional thinking on our parts to match up quality with quality and look at the process to determine the accuracy of the tool and the component features that will that we'll be machining. Is finish of utmost importance? Is the tolerance tight or is it a critical feature of the component that I want to be consistent throughout the manufacturing life cycle? From left to right, let's just take a look at some general rule of thumbs in the way of total indicated runout accuracy or TIR for short. A drill chuck is typically good for around five to 10,000 TIR total on a good day at that. There are a lot of internal components and three jaws typically that experience a high amount of wear and tear. A side lock holder or weld-in shank is good for around one to two thousandths TIR on average. These are still one of the most popular holders out there. And unfortunately, some people like to brag about how long they've actually owned one of them. I had a situation a few years ago where a tool crib associate did just that, claiming that his Cat 50 side lock holder was still good after almost 20 years. So I had them sweep the inside diameter with a dial indicator. And that holder had over 10,000 TIR run out. Then you have ER collets. They're, they're known for around one to two ten thousandths of an inch TIR. That's on the holder itself. But as I mentioned on the previous slide, you stack up the collet tolerance of another two to three ten thousandths of an inch. And it doesn't take much on the gauge length to start experiencing exaggerated run out. These are extremely versatile, but can also become inferior over time due to worn tapers and collets over the life cycle of these holders and accessories. The last two being hydraulic and shrink fit. Is one superior over the other? Well, that depends on who you ask. The bottom line is, both options are your best line of defense against cutting tool runout, given they both are maintaining around one ten thousandths of an inch TIR and even less in some cases. The only slight difference in these two holder types is the gripping force or the added pull-off security of the cutting tool. Hydraulic holders are the most user-friendly in my opinion, having low maintenance requirements, very few parts and accessories, making it a great selection. In most cases, all you have or all you need is a simple Allen wrench to remove and replace the cutting tool. Shrink fit holders require a significant upfront expenditure especially when you factor in the cost of the shrink fit machine. However, the benefits of using this type of end mill holder justify the higher price tag. Some of the advantages are such as removing uh, moving parts such as collets, wrenches out of the equation. And when comparing a hydraulic holder versus shrink fit, you'll find that shrink fit offers roughly the same runout accuracy, but their gripping force can be significantly higher. Shrink fit holders boast the thinnest nose diameter of all holder types, also known as pencil style holders, which means less tool changing as your end mills can reach into tighter spaces. Either one of these options continually prove to be a worthwhile investment that will increase your operations productivity and save you money. Why do we need to worry about tool holder maintenance? The life cycle of a particular holder. Just like any other component in the setup, tool holders have a given life cycle based on its use. This can be a slow development over a period of time and be hard to recognize if we are not aware of it. It also has a direct impact on tool life. As I mentioned, tool holders that do not properly hold the cutting tool itself will cause premature tool failure, increase our tooling costs, or CPU for a particular component. And it's an important part of the machining process and quality aspect. The cutting process will only be as good as the device holding the cutting tool. 
We will continue to lose valuable optimizations of our process if we turn a blind eye to the connectivity aspect of our cutting tools. Quality of the machine component usually suffers in the way of chasing tight dimensional tolerances or surface finish and the overall lack of repeatability in the process itself. This is more than likely contributing to an increase in scrap parts as well. It can result in costly downtime. When operators are working on a tool holder or sticking the proverbial Band-Aid on, on it due to neglect, there are no parts being produced, resulting in costly downtime or less green light machining as mentioned earlier. And it is ultimately less money and effort than repairs. A small amount of time and money that it takes to properly do routine maintenance or replacement of a damaged tool holder far exceeds the time wasted to repair a neglected holder. And since we're talking about tool holders, we should always remember to consider retention knob or pull studs as well. How do you determine when to replace a retention knob or a pull stud? You should be routinely checking your pull studs for signs of wear, micro cracks, or any other damage, and replace any that are not in perfect condition. Generally speaking, pull stud has a lifespan of two to three years or can be less based on higher hours, hours of usage or runtime. Be sure to consider the number of cycles the holder has been through over a period of time to determine the most optimal life cycle in your particular environment. I feel this is a component of the tool holder often overlooked due to it being hidden up in the spindle or tucked away in the tool magazine out uh, in the machine. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Let's never forget how much strain or force is being applied to this very small cross-section of the entire tool holder setup. Ball bearing gripper types are much harder on the pull studs than the collet style grippers. They can actually reduce the pull stud life to as little as six to 12 months. So watch for indentations caused by the ball bearings and replace the pull stud immediately if any are seen. In, in these machines, even minor scuff marks are a sign and it's time to replace your pull stud. When you replace a pull stud, clean and degrease the thread, apply a low or medium force thread locking compound and be sure Fork to proper specs. For example, Oz Machine recommends 55 foot pounds of torque on their 40 taper spindles. There are also high torque retention knob machines that are much quieter and very beneficial, especially when roughing difficult to machine materials such as titanium or other super alloys. They also eliminate fretting of the tool holder shank taper. Regularly check the spindle mouth wear also known as bell mouthing. This is a direct result of improper pull stud maintenance and can cause an additional run out in the total stack up of tolerances trying to be maintained between the machine and the cutting tool itself. The spindle taper usually wears most right around the mouth because that's where the area is most easily contaminated by chips and it's the area that takes the most abuse. Bell mouthing wear at the spindle taper opening can sometimes go seemingly unnoticed for very long periods of time, resulting in costly downtime in the end. You can check for this problem a couple of different ways. First, like in the left diagram shows, you can check the TIR measured at the spindle versus the TIR measured at the bench or a digital measuring device, such as a tool presetter for the same tool holder. If they differ in any significant amount, you may have a problem. Another, another method is to blew up a known good tool holder and check it in the spindle. Best, of course, if you use a newer quality holder as well. But if you're getting less than 75% contact with the taper, you've got a problem. Threading, shown on the right, is usually caused by pressure exerted by the retention knob thread engagement. Coupled with the elastic properties of the tool holder steel, this creates a bulge at the small end of the tool holder. Once expansion occurs, the holder will not pull all the way into the spindle and it will fail to contact more than 70% of the spindle taper surface. The bulge stops the tool holder from making full contact, causing vibration, chatter, non-repeatability, poor finish, shortened tool life, premature or excessive spindle wear. And of course, as mentioned, the additional run out as well. How often should we check the TIR on our spindles? Most machine tool builders recommend checking it every six months and of course immediately after any serious crash.
Tap testing and generating stability load diagrams has been a standard technique used by machining researchers and universities and large manufacturing plants for milling optimization for several years now and is gaining popularity. A small accelerometer is attached to the tool point using wax. The tool is tapped while in the spindle of the targeted machine with an instrument type hammer. The force applied from the tapping procedure is then measured along with the tool's response to the force, creating a stability lobe reading. Stability lobe diagram is an effective tool which helps the operator to select specific cutting parameters during the production to avoid chatter or vibration. Stability lobes are then plotted against the axial depth of cut versus spindle speed, which allows or which shows a, a boundary between stable and unstable cutting regions. Again, great advancements in technology that we can all agree are beneficial to us. But there's a slight caveat to this procedure. The software and the analysis side of this will never be able and is capable of knowing if the cutting tool is being held properly, or worse yet, it's in a damaged holder. Yes, it will accommodate the potentially inferior setup by recommending the appropriated adjusted parameters to aid the running of that tool in the environment that you put it in, good or bad, right? So here again, in this example, Tap testing technology is only as good as the environment we create for it to function in. Condition monitoring or vibration monitoring for a spindle involves capturing real-time data linked to machine tool failures, unintended human be uh, behavior, machine spindle overloads, and is ideal for further analysis and diagnostics. Health monitoring of a machine spindle not only enhances the overall performance of the CNC machine, but also potentially detects any inefficiencies or lack in functionality of the program machining process. Rework and rejection of the finished products can be significantly reduced as a result of this technology. Any prevention of damaged goods or unnecessary waste, especially when raw material is not cheap, is a huge plus for any industry today. It's not necessarily easy to implement vibration monitoring systems for a spindle, as multiple factors need to be considered, which include the type of spindle, the frequency range to be measured, the spindle rotation speed, and the strategic mounting and positioning of those sensors themselves. Threshold settings, measurement routines, and methods of specific data point analysis are some of the vital pieces of information that need to be extracted to directly combat inefficiencies and ultimately improving the overall performance of that machine. Fixture elements are a fundamental part of virtually every manufacturing operation from machining to assembly. During the machining process, the workpiece motion is generated by cutting forces and localized clamp forces along the workpiece fixture interface, which affects the workpiece location accuracy. This can have a significant influence on the machine part quality. Contact forces in the normal perpendicular direction directly influence the workpiece deformation. The tangential or friction cutting forces along the workpiece fixture interface also play an important role in the fixture design. It can be utilized to reduce the number of fixture components, potentially exposing more workpiece features to machining operations. It also provides a damping mechanism to dissipate the energy being generated from the machining forces out of the workpiece fixture system. Therefore, modeling of the friction conditions along the workpiece fixture interface is critical. Contact problems with friction are generally complicated by the fact that the fixture to component contact surface can experience slipping, shifting, rolling, or tension release, depending on the amount of normal or tangential forces of, at the given point of machining contact. So there's a high degree of engineering strategy placed on the variety of clamping methods and strategic position of the clamps to aid in the support of the machining environment. And lastly, speed, feed, and depth of cut. I had intentionally left this until the end because I am most certain that this is where we all, including myself, have been guilty of starting in past applications of our cutting tools. I hope we understand now that the essential building blocks of these three very critical parameters, speed, feed, and depth of cut, are only as strong as the environment, or again, the connectivity 
that we put them in. The strength of the most high-performance cutting tool is only as strong as the connectivity to the machine itself. We are potentially undermining the cutting tool performance with an inferior setup and could be missing out on some very significant optimizations, such as higher metal removal rates, cycle time reduction, productivity gains and throughput, and of course, all of these contributing to the overall efficiency of our equipment. So one of my final pieces of advice is to first turn to the tool holder section of the catalog or website before turning to the technical parameters section. With the added layer of confidence, knowing you are setting your cutting tools up for success. Thank you for your time today, and I hope you found this information to be beneficial and applicable in your own manufacturing environment as you continue to improve your cutting tools environment and ultimately setting your cutting tools up for success. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill, for the presentation. Um, uh, hi, hello again, this is Bill Koenig of SM Media once more. And uh, we're now going to do the Q&A session. So let me get ready. And so we have a few questions ready to go. And so I will start with this one. Do you suggest using lock light with pull studs? There are, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, there are three um, variations of Loctite. I think that was maybe what they meant. There is a high, a low, and a medium uh, release or force um, version. So uh, as stated, we really recommend the medium or low to medium. So that way you do have the opportunity to then release that retention knob at a later time when you need to replace it. All right, another question. Where does power grip fall on the run out to accuracy chart? Power grip has a very high um, accuracy of run out. So um, it's, it's fairly new. It's a, a more of a, I think they're referencing to the lower tapered uh, collet style. Um, and again, there's several moving components in that and, and, and out of the box, um, they will work extremely well. And their, their life cycle is actually uh, very well as, as well. So um, nothing in fear about that setup, but as we all know, um, the vehicles that we drive every day, um, the more components that are put into this vehicle, the more opportunities for wear and tear. So anytime we can remove components and accessories and collets and, and, and tapers and um, um, other components, we remove the, um, uh, the opportunity for uh, wear characteristics. But uh, those do fall into that, uh, um, into also microns or that one ten thousandths to two ten thousandths of TIR. All right, another question in the queue. Is there a variation of tapper hardness depth from one brand to another? Is the depth of hardness of tapper impact accuracy life of tapper? Taper. Taper, yes. Um, there is a Sorry. standard, and uh, the, the case hardening, I would say um, there, you know, we would, we would love to say that there isn't, but um, it, when you when you buy quality, you get quality. I'm a firm believer in that. So, um, if you were to do your own testing, I'm sure that you would uncover that there is variation in that taper hardness. Um, but uh, there is a standard in the industry that we, that that we should be adhering to. And um, but uh, again, um, um, I you know um, there, there's definitely. Um, some variations out there in the field for sure. I w I w in that regard, um, and if you were to, if you have that testing capability in your facility, um, I would encourage you to check some of the more drastic price points. And um, if I had to guess, the lower price point would come in a softer case hardening. All right, another question. Um, what would be a safe life cycle of a typical shrink fit holder? So, um, and that's another one where it depends on who you ask, but uh, in my research that I've done with shrink fit holders, most shrink fit holders carry an average life cycle of 2,000 or more shrinks. 
So if you're shrinking that tool uh, once or twice a week, I, I just do the math quickly, I think you're you're easily looking at a 12 to 15 year life cycle. So it, it's it's pretty impressive. What you, what you need to pay attention with that is having the the proper inspection equipment for micro fractures. Um, when you anytime we introduce thermal expansion and contraction, and we're manipulating and changing the molecular structure of uh, that and during that shrink and that heat process, obviously there's deterioration. But most uh, are are good for around 2,000 cycles. All right. Another question. Should a hydraulic holder be used with a tool that has a welded shank, parentheses, a flat? The industry will, will, will tell you no, and there's reasons for that. Uh, that. That membrane that's inside of a hydraulic holder, or that what they call fulcrum technology, the fulcrum membrane, um, is doing the same thing at a thinner level. It's, in, it's expanding and contracting that ID wall. So if there is a, a concave feature on the shank, such as a weldon flat, um, there is the potential to damage the, um, the fulcrum or that thin membrane on the ID bore of the holder. Um, so you'll notice, too, that if you have the opportunity, um, what you can do is you can sleeve it or go to a larger bore diameter on your hydraulic holder and then use a sleeve that is fully cylindrical to accommodate that weld and shank. All right, we will press on. Have you witnessed, hang on, have you witnessed holder run out due to over working pull studs on CAT 40 holders? Unfortunately, I was in a machine shop uh, several years ago when a um, machine started to make an, uh, an abnormal sound, and uh, the cat, it was a Cat 40 in particular, and it actually threw the tool holder when the retention knob broke. Um, so, again, think about that very small cross-section of a retention knob and all of the pulling forces taking place at that very particular cross-section. Um, these stretch over time, the threads stretch over time, causing that bulge at the taper. Um, so um, definitely um, I've seen uh, broken retention knobs, and I was I actually witnessed at one point a, a, a Cat 40 tool holder being slung from a, a spindle at a very high RPM. So um, yes, most definitely. Okay. I hope nobody was hurt when you saw that. but. Uh... That sounds kind oh, of dramatic. It was, it was in an enclosed machine, so all the proper okay. safeguards. Great. Good to hear it. All right, another question. What oil do you recommend, if any, for storing tool holders or collets? So any, there, they, they, there are several spray or rust inhibitors that, uh, that you can purchase over the counter or from your local supplier that leave a of thin film or residue that can be easily wiped off. I don't encourage any of the heavier uh, uh, rust inhibitors, but they do make, again, just like the Loctite, they make variations of that. So look for the thin film or the light rust inhibitors um, to do that. That way they can be sto uh, stored in carts, especially if your holders are being you know, managed or stored in a, in a Vidmar cabinet or uh, on shelving or in, in uh, uh, tool carts for long periods of time. They're exposed to the, the humidity and the moisture factor, you know, in the in the machining environment. So um, typically like a, an off name drop for WD-40 probably because it's been around for so long, but uh, um, that's just one example. All right, we'll move on. What can cause excessive runout in a collet chuck tool holder? So, uh, as mentioned, the, the collet chuck tool holders, you know, there's varying components to that. You have the, 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 the collet nut, the, the, the collet itself, and um, they seem to be the most problematic because of all the components involved and the, the inferiority of or the opportunity, I should say, to introduce um, 
outside external substances such as chip and um, uh, other materials. So um, the taper um, in, in itself, where the collet marries up to the ID taper, is probably one of the most critical ones. So if you're looking inside of that taper and you're noticing what I mentioned about chip indentations or any marring um, outside of normal uh, collet co surface contact, that's an indicator. You also will want to look either through a loop or magnification and look for micro fractures on that ID taper as well. I have seen several of uh, ER or DA collet style holders in the field where run out was a problem um, where those were cracked. And, the, and then I also noticed that there were several associates tightening that collet nut with a four foot pipe on the end of their wrench thinking that the tighter that was, the better it was going to hold that cutting tool. They didn't, you know, they were trying to avoid push or pull out of that end mill. Uh, but ultimately, they ended up splitting that taper and creating micro cracks. But every time you take the nut and the collet out, it springs back. So it's very hard to see. So you just need to look closely for those micro fractures. All right. We have another question. Is there ever a scenario where flexibility or run out in a tool holder is acceptable? I'm going to intentionally pause because I think everybody thinks I'm going to say no, but the answer is actually yes. So synchro tapping or, or, or tapping for floating heads, right, um, is, is one example of where you need flexibility in that. So the design, you know, uses a, a synchronous spindle and it has um, beveled uh, spring washers in it. And we're actually allowing for um, a cushion or a shock absorber in both axial and radial deflection for the tap so that we're allowing the tap to float because even the most advanced rigid tapping program or accuracy of that synchronizer in the machine software and or servos is never 100% uh, accurate. There's, there will always be a lag in the delay of the spindle reverse when it's time to retract that tap. So what these do is they create that shock absorber or that cushion in that transition of reversing of spindle uh, to remove the tapping uh, process. So that's one example, and that's, there's, it's really one of the only ones, but uh, um, yeah, it's interesting. By the way, we are kind of getting down to the last few questions, so if you are thinking about asking a question, now would be a good time to get one in using the Q&A box, but uh, we still have a, a few. So here's another one. Do you have any advice to drive this home with, say, operations managers who do not want to shut down long enough to check holders? Um, I know that's a challenging um, aspect of, of, of this feature. Uh, uh, preventative maintenance always supersedes maintenance, in my opinion. So. Um, if, if you're able to capture um, the data or log the information to provide to that, uh, that supervisor the amount of time uh, that is potentially being wasted as a result of not stopping or taking that time, um, that's what I would encourage you to do is actually gather and collect that information, um, you know, to, to really kind of elevate the, uh, and justify the cause. Um, secondly, there, you know, and again, this is there's a cost associated with this, but another thing we need to be um, more proactive in is potentially redundant tooling. So, if you have an opportunity to to, to pr purchase redundant holders, and then quickly do those change outs, pull out the the uh, the set of holders that were in the machine, and then that way you're not slowing down production. You're able to have those offline and bench those and, and do your inspections. All right, another question, this one just in. Is holder gauge length rigidity relationship the same across different platforms, or is there a gain or loss depending on method of gripping tool? Parentheses, side lock, ER, hydraulic, shrink, parentheses. So, um, yes, there is, because I think um, anytime we have equal uh, clamping forces on a cylindrical diameter, 
what we do is we create that stability factor at a much longer gauge length. So anytime you go up in quality or go up in uh, accuracy of your tool holder, you pick up significant gains in, in uh, added gauge length. So if you're suffering uh, from chatter or vibration on an application using a side lock, for example, I would encourage you to, and you, and you need more gauge length, um, then I would encourage you to step up your game uh, on the holder in the way of the quality and the accuracy of runout. Um, but then again, that this all goes back to, and I, and you know, the question would have to be asked, and I'd be more than happy to have this conversation uh, with this question. But uh, is what are the cutting forces, and how are they being generated? Is it axial? What is the entry angle? Um, is it all 90 degree radial cutting forces, or is there some axial cutting taking place as well? Um, and how you can manipulate that through machining parameters and um, toolpath approach as well. So a um, couple variables there, and again, in modularity, you start stacking up uh, modular holders, um, you know, and you have, uh, the, you, you're introducing uh, connection points that create um, inferior uh, points of contact radially for radial engagement. But axially, they actually are a contributing factor to um, breaking up harmonics and vibration when you're generating axial cutting forces. All right, here's another question. To what degree does an integrated custom tool holder slash cutting tool improve chip removal performance? So I think they're asking about an integrated shank, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there can be significant gains in this. Um, we do several specials for many of our customers where we do integral shanks. Um, and we've seen um, some fairly significant um, performance gains in the way of uh, metal removal rate. Um, um, it also allows you to customize the gauge length uh, by integrating the cutting tool features. Sometimes when you have to buy um, each individual component, uh, the gauge length ends up being much longer than what may be desired. But by going to an integral shank um, in a particular environment, um, it really can help um, with process security, again, cutting tool optimization, and uh, there's usually um, a significant gain to that. All right. Now we are down to our last question. It might be um, – well, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. How many tool Shoot. customer drawings – I'm sorry? I said how many two. Tool, okay, how many tool customer drawings you've actually seen have a runout spec? So, um, cool tool customer drawings. Um, it depends on if they're referring to an assembly feature or just on the uh, tool holder itself. Um, so any given manufacturer should be more than willing and capable of providing an inspection report or documentation based on any uh, cutting tool, also um, whether even if it's a our holder in this example, or um, whether it's a standard or a special. Um, you know, we, we manufacture these cutting tools all day, every day, and uh, we're, we're constantly you know, holding uh, our quality standards at the highest level. So we have the documentation, and in most cases, if uh, the manufacturers should, should be more than willing to offer that information and the tolerances that they're maintaining. Well, we have uh, another one that just came in, another question. Have you ever seen cutters pull out of shrink fit holders? And if so, what was the solution? Uh, the only time in my career that I've actually seen a uh, cutting tool pull out of a shrink fit holder was in reference to um, the shrink fit holder being ran beyond its life cycle. Uh, the shrink fit tool holder under inspection had the micro fractures and the micro cracks from excessive heat shrink cycles. Um, that is the only time 
I've seen a, uh, a tool pull out of a shrink fit holder. Um, and of course, um, you know, that was done in collaboration with the customer and, and we resolved that problem very quickly by uh, getting those uh, inferior holders out of the equation. Okay. Um, I do not see any more questions and we are near the end of our time. So as the moderator, I'm going to call an end to it. If we get any last minute ones, we'll pass them along to the folks at Arch. But um, I want to thank um, Bill, uh, Bill for his, Bill Orris for his presentation. And uh, thanks for your flexibility handling the questions as well. So as I Thank said, you. Uh, that, that's all the time we have. Um, if you joined us late or you just want to hear the presentation again, a replay will be available starting at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can ac access it the same way you joined us now. Again, thanks to Bill Orris of Arch Cutting Tools, and we want to thank you for being with us. We hope you can join us again for another SME Media webinar. Take care, everybody.